a brief interview with the planets, hosted by D-Rad. Rad for short. Let's start with introductions. We'll do this alphabetically, so as not to offend. Earth. Earth here. And feeling lively. Thanks, Earth. Good to hear. Up next, Jupiter. Yo. Okay, up next, m m m mars Red. E. Very clever, Mars. Mercury? Mercury here. Hey, Mercury, you're slurring a bit. You spending too much time close to the sun? <laughs> How about way out Neptune? That's far out Neptune. Thank you. And I got to update my profile pic because that dark blue blemish faded a bit and some new ones have appeared. So embarrassing. Thanks for the personal info there, Neptune. And how about Pluto? Pluto? Sorry, my bad. Pluto is no longer invited to these things. Sorry, kid. Saturn? Ring-a-ding-ding -ding. Ring -ding indeed. How about Uranus? Thanks for pronouncing my name correctly. Unfortunately, I'm often the butt end of so many jokes. Like that one? Huh? Uh, never mind. Uh, lastly, we have the beautiful, but rather treacherous, Venus. Hello, Venus. Hello, Rad. I'm glad to round things out. So, basically, the word is you're all here because of what I will affectionately call star snot. The formation of heavier, more complex elements that were created in a supernova, like a sneeze, long before you guys came to the scene. I'd like to ask one of you what happened afterward. Who will start out and take this one? I got this, rat. All of that star snot, as you say, began as a fairly large, spherical cloud of gas and dust. Gravitational forces collapsed this cloud and it began to flatten into a disk due to the conservation of energy, momentum, and angular momentum. Thanks, big guy. What you're describing is the beginning of the solar nebula theory. So, after this collapse occurred, then what happened? The spinning gas disk is really hot in the middle and is colder further out. This temperature gradient dictates what sort of materials will condense out of the disk. At the center is a proto-sun. It's not our sun you'd recognize until it ignites in nuclear fire, the fusion of hydrogen, which is the predominant element in the disk, into helium. After ignition the solar wind cleaned out the smaller mass material, but the stuff with substantial mass accreted and became us and other sundry things. Hold on, I'm getting a little weepy here. Wow, thanks Venus. Yeah, I'll bet the story of the birth of you and your siblings can be rather emotional. I do find it ironic that you of all planets explain what happens as a result of spinning gas, since you hardly spin at all. More on that later though. Um, so how does this temperature gradient affect your physical properties? I mean, there are some distinct differences and a number of similarities some of you possess. How did your distance from the sun affect how you matured? All sorts of materials can condense out from a gaseous state once you're about 0.2 AU away from the sun. For example, metal oxides from at about 1600 degrees Kelvin, silicates at about 1400 degrees Kelvin. My little brothers and sisters, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are little guys that are composed mainly of metal and rock while hydrogen compounds are still gaseous. Their location is before what is known as the frost line. The asteroid belt is also before the frost line, but orbital resonances with Big Pro Jupiter meant that another sibling couldn't form. We're all still sad about it to this day, but we all just keep slinging along. Wow, that's pretty tough news about the asteroid belt there. Uh, Neptune, you sound okay though after four and a half billion years to ponder the situation. Well, I'd like to know more about the properties of the planets that formed after the frost line. Appearing after the frost line are the Jovian planets Jupiter and Saturn, who are composed mostly of gaseous hydrogen and helium. Captured from the solar nebula, high pressures closer to the core condenses hydrogen into liquid form, and then an exotic metallic form perhaps giving rise to their enormous magnetic fields. Neptune and I are considered the ice giants. We are made mostly of hydrogen compounds interspersed with some metals and rocks in our cores. We do possess some gases in our outer layer but our mantle is composed of ices such as water, ammonia, and methane, giving us our beautiful blue hue. Terrific! 
So why is it that y'all orbit in the same direction around the sun and basically along the same ecliptic plane for the most part within three and a half degrees, except for pokey little Mercury, who's at seven degrees? The original spinning disk of gas and dust mentioned before in the discussion, the solar nebula, had unified orientation, and the conservation of angular momentum ensured that accreting bodies would also continue their revolutions in the same direction. We are all in basically the same plane due to the flattening of this disk, again due to angular momentum, and gravitational effects. Our orbits are elliptical but nearly circular due to the occurrence of many collisions during that time of formation, averaging out speeds and energies of the interacting bodies. Since you brought up the ecliptic, an interesting thing to note is that your information is Earth-centric. Thanks to humans. The measurement of orbital inclination is performed relative to Earth. Venus and Saturn both have an orbital inclination of 3.4 degrees. Wouldn't it have made more sense to measure relative to their orbits and as the baseline since they are matched? Um, yeah, I suppose. But with the exception of space probes, all measurements were made from your biosphere. So, like it or not, you're still very prominent in our overall perspective, even though we... <clears throat> know full well that you're not the center of the universe nor the solar system. But we love you lots, Mama Earth. We just need to start showing it better as a species. So what's up with the asteroids? We heard Neptune point the finger at Jupiter and offer blame. But how do orbital resonances work such that there's no planet there but enough material to form a small planet under other circumstances? Since I'm a close neighbor to the belt, I'll feel this one. Thanks, Mars. First of all, Jupiter's mass is much larger than any of the objects in the asteroid belt. It so happens that there are several key orbital resonances with the asteroids and Jupiter that create what are known as Kirkwood gaps. These gaps are zones within the belt that have a very low number of asteroids present. They occur at periodic orbital ratios of 2 to 1, 3 to 1, 5 to 2, and 7 to 3. The periodic interaction with Jupiter means that its gravity cleans them out of that area, impeding the accretion of planetesimals such that a planet could not and cannot form. I'm not as upset about it as some of my siblings are. Granted I'm named after the god of war, but me and Jupiter are tight and have features that make us well read. Mars, come on! Do you have any other type of humor you can share with us? That's twice with the red puns already. And what about comets? Along with asteroids, why do we also see them in the solar system? I've taken my share of lumps, and still show it. I'm on this one. Okay there, little guy. While asteroids are rocky planetesimals that remained in the inner solar system after the proto-sun ignited, comets are icy planetesimals that remained in the outer solar system. Those that were near the Jovians and ice giants were probably booted out in random directions forming the Oort cloud way out thousands of AU away. Past the orbit of Neptune where gravitational effects were considerably smaller, large comets and dwarf planets form through accretion in a zone that is now known as the Kuiper Belt some 30 to 55 AU away. Last question before we get a little more personal. What's up with moons? Earth has a very significant moon that evidence shows to have been created accidentally in a collision with the Mars-sized planetesimal. Mars itself has two very small moons, among the smallest in the solar system. They are oblong and not very spherical. The vast majority of lunar action is at the outer solar system. Saturn, we haven't heard from you yet. Astolians and ice giants harbor over 100 known moons. Most of them are relatively small and were probably captured asteroids or comets. Larger moons developed in what could be a local protoplanetary disk widen the larger solar nebula. My big brother Jupiter has the largest moon in Ganymede, a candidate for liquid water in Europa, and also cradles the most volcanically active one in Io. I have the most massive moon in the system with Titan, and it has a very thick nitrogen-rich atmosphere, the only one in the solar system beyond my sister, Earth. Titan is the only moon other than Earth's whose surface has been visited by a human Bill Blander. Okay, to wrap up our interview, I have a simple request. Describe an interesting feature about yourself that most humans might not know. At 0.39 AU from the Sun, we begin with Mercury. My elliptical orbit.
group it actually processes every so slightly. Newtonian physics was unable to provide a suitable explanation of my orbital behavior, but Einstein's theory of general relativity nailed down the reason, and in turn I helped experimentally validate his epic work. Bravo! Up next at 0.72 AU is Venus. Many humans know about my thick atmosphere with crushing pressures and runaway greenhouse effect, but most don't know that my rotation is in the opposite direction of other planets and it is very slow. My day is longer than my year. My day is 243 Earth days while my year is 225 Earth days. I also helped Galileo confirm the Copernican model by showing off my full set of faces, from Earth's perspective of course. Hey, do you want to see me naked? What? Venus, put your clouds back on, please. Up next, we have the always gorgeous Earth at a lovely 1 AU away from the sun. What is something that you can tell your human inhabitants that they most probably don't know? Sorry to say, Red, but though I'm privileged to be the only known planet to harbor life, there have been five mass extinctions in my lifetime so far. One of them that occurred over 250 million years ago killed off 96% of marine and 70% of land-based species. Recovery is not an easy process. Many of your scientists think that there may be signs of a sixth mass extinction on the horizon. Please, please be careful as it's very stressful and I have such hope for your species. Wow. That's painfully stunning and sobering. A huge bummer. Weirdly, in some manner, it took those extinctions and a sequence of events to give rise to humanity. But we have to treat you and the features of the solar system with the utmost respect in order to prevent another catastrophe. I'm a bit shaken, really. Man. Well, moving on, how about you, Mars? You're one and a half AUs from the sun. Well, you already indicated that I possess some of the smallest moons in the solar system. How about this? At times I have global sandstorms that cover a vast majority of my surface. As it turns out, because my atmosphere is only one-tenth as thick as Earth's, they would not amount to crazy damage and a horrible antenna in one side like seen at the beginning of the movie, The Martian. I took the flick though. It was readily one of my favorites. <sighs> Up next, we foray from the terrestrial planets onto the Jovians and ice giants. At 5.2 AU from the Sun, we have our largest planet, Jupiter. I'll give you all something short and sweet. Even though I am the largest planet and have the most mass, I whip around my rotational axis and actually have the shortest day of any of the planets of the solar system at 9 hours and 55 minutes. This rapid motion flattens me out a bit and also intensifies my powerful magnetic field. At 9.5 AU away from the sun is a fan favorite, Saturn. What's something interesting you can tell humans, as they already find you mighty intriguing? My rays are an obvious feature you humans seem to adore. What you might not know about them is that they are among the thinnest structures ever found in the universe. Because my rays are composed of smaller boulders and particles that continually collide, they will eventually move inward and due to atmospheric drag, enter my atmosphere. Sadly this hallmark feature won't be part of me forever as it will be gone in perhaps 500 million years. So enjoy them while you can. Oh, I also wear a silly hexagonal hat on my North Pole. They are the result of small perturbations in the jet stream, but your scientists are coming very close to fully explaining it. Uranus, you're our penultimate planet at a distance of 19.2 AU from the Sun. I'm the first planet that you humans detected that required the use of a telescope. My rotational axis is significantly tipsy as I rotate on my side by an amount of 98 degrees. Speaking of degrees, I have the coldest temperature of any planet, although my twin Neptune is on average colder than me. Oh, uh, I also have a significant ring system too, though not as brazen as brother Saturn. And finally at 30 AU from the sun, we have Neptune. 
My position was determined by the use of mathematical models due to my gravitational effect on my twin Uranus and was verified by a telescope in 1846. I have a 2 to 3 orbital resonance with Pluto, and so the closest Uranus can actually be to our friendly dwarf planet neighbor is a shorter distance that I can ever get to Pluto. My main moon, Triton, is known to have an active ice based geology replete with ice geysers. Lastly, my twin and I are very lonely. Only one space probe, Voyager 2, has ever visited us. Please do come again. Well, we did send a probe to Pluto recently. Granted, the New Horizons mission was underway well before he was kicked out of the Planetary Club, as determined by the rules of the International Astronomical Union in 2006. There may just be a new mission spawned by NASA to revisit you crazy ice giants in the near future. Hey! Thanks again, planets of the solar system. Y'all were stellar. Rad out. <laughs>